Um, hello and absolute pleasure to have Robert Peel on the Teacher's Toolkit podcast today. Uh, I've been completely badgering Robert to come on the podcast for a long time now. As you'll find out when we have our conversation, uh, he's got a huge amount of experience in teaching and education. He also is an amazing author. Um, he's a historian. He's a co-head. So we've got so, so much to talk about this evening. Um, so thank you so much, Robert, for coming on the podcast. Um, can you just tell us a little bit about your background, uh, where, where you came from, how you worked yourself up to become the co-head of West London Free School and sort of what you're focusing on now? That'd be great. Absolutely. Um, so I became a teacher in 2011 um, and started teaching in Birmingham. And the first to admit when I started teaching, I wasn't entirely sure that it was the career for me. Um, but really, really fell in love with it and uh, moved to the West London Free School in 2014, uh, where I've been ever since. And I became an assistant head there in 2016, um, then a deputy head uh, a few years later. And then very soon after becoming a deputy head myself, my fellow deputy um, became joint head teacher. That I'm doing currently. Um, Absolutely brilliant. And like, it's just a whirlwind for you. But obviously, you worked your way up quite quickly, I suppose. Mm. Um, but and I remember the first time I ever met you because I came to West London Free School because you organised a history conference. Um, and I remember sitting there and I think you were just so above and beyond anything that I'd ever seen before. And I remember going back to my head teacher and going, oh, I just don't understand um, how he's done that. So I think you were saying something about you, you might spend a whole lesson or a whole big chunk of time reading with a class and like interrogating a text together. And I sort of asked you the question, well, how do you how do you, pro, you know, showcase that to an Ofsted inspector? And um, when I went back to my head teacher at the time, he said, well, did you look in his books? And I said, well, no, I didn't. And he said, well, yeah, obviously that's how he would do it. But it was just it was just really mm. inspiring for me, actually. And that's why I wanted to get you on is because I just wanted to get inside your brain a little bit more as well. Yeah, well, I, 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 I get it either for being ahead of the curve in terms of history or the quite quick ascent at the West End Preschool. Both have just been by dint of the fact that free schools are very peculiar places to work and um, it was incredibly hard work and very stressful when I was first there we, we didn't decide and there were all sorts of things that weren't in place but the one massive benefit was that gave you a blank slate just to think very innovatively about things like curriculum and it meant that we didn't have any inherited ways of working um, we didn't have any inherited schemes of work when I first started there was only year seven, eight, nine, and 10. So I could spend almost all the time thinking about key stage three. Um, so plus a, a license and a blank slate on which to uh, um, do things a reasonably innovative way. Although increasingly with every year that passes, it feels like what we're doing is normal, which I suppose is, is a nice thing. Absolutely. Um, so just unpicking your sort of story behind being a co-head, because obviously I'm, I'm yeah. very... I'm very, very uh, in, into that, I suppose. So I used to be a co-head and then I went off on maternity leave and I've come back as something slightly different. Mm. Um, so I didn't really know what to do. And I'm just really struggling to get back in into that sort of position again as co-head. Um, and obviously I, I'm from secondary schools in Suffolk and you're in London. Mm. So I just wanted to know sort of your background and your experience of it and how, it, how it's going. So it's going wonderful. And I, I think it's a, brilliant model if you can make it work mm -hmm. however I think it's dependent in our case my co-head teacher uh, is called Ben McLaughlin he's in charge of pastoral and behavior and curriculum and I think it works very well but because of quite uh, fortuitous circumstances which are that we both joined the school at the same time in 2014 we both became deputy head teachers at the same time huge amount of respect for what each other does but absolutely zero desire to do each other's job um we were very good friends which um which helps and a year on we remain very good friends um i'm long may that last um so i i joked with members of staff that it works if it's a love match but if it's an arranged marriage uh, i don't think it necessarily has has the chance of succeeding um, so I think it has it has to be very particular circumstances. I wonder if they're the same as when you became joint head teacher, that it was someone who you'd known for some time. Yeah, and it, um, so we, we I mean, he joined the year ahead of me, but we're the same age, same point in our careers, became assistant heads together. Um, mm. 
right. on, on, on the yin to his yang. So he was progress yeah. standards, um, and I was sort of teaching and learning a curriculum. And obviously, we actually had somebody yeah. somebody else to sort of run on the behaviour. But obviously, we both did behaviour at the same time as well. So we yeah. were actually part of a free school too um, within that trust, and it was quite small at the time. So you just it just worked really, really well for it. Um, obviously, now I want it back. <laughs> Um, so I mean, uh, I, yeah, yeah, I really do think it, it feels like a, it also, I think both of us, both Ben and I were, were, thought that we were years away of being a head teacher uh, when we were appointed. But when the idea was suggested to us that we might be joint head teachers, mm. that felt feasible. Yeah. Um, so it feels like a very nice way into school leadership as well. Um, yeah, I think I think it's a. I mean, maybe it's still a honeymoon period. <laughs> uh, it no, may all come crashing down, but I don't think it will. We've been ready either, but because we did it together, you just yeah. had that support, didn't you? Yeah. One of yeah. our. Um, Loved it. Um, yeah. So, what what are some of the focuses at the moment for you as a head? Because obviously we're come we're coming we're still coming through a pandemic. Um, I've seen you know op operationally it just became an operational nightmare. So every day your mm. focuses weren't necessarily implementing a long a long haul plan around teach learning and curriculum it was more about mm -hmm. sort of you know figuring out your cover and figuring out who's going to stand in front of the staff members for example so what what's what's your focus at the moment in the west london free school or as a head so just getting up to speed with that and also keeping our heads above water with uh, pupil absences, absences cover being harder than that. Yeah, that, that has kept us occupied for the most part this year. Um, we have done new things at the school, but I think it has been mostly operational. And I think if, even if it weren't for COVID, that would have been the case because we've just been sort of getting our feet under the desk and... Um, uh, and, and getting used to the role. And the other thing is the school um, is in a pretty good position. There, there wasn't a burning platform for change to what we were doing. Um, so, goodness, I think in the years, in the coming years, we've actually booked out some time over half term to have a, to properly have a think about this and write a mm -hmm. school development plan ready for next year. Um, but the, in terms of teaching and learning, the big thing that we're really um, focusing on this year and will continue to focus on next year is pupil dialogue in the classroom. So one yeah. of the things that we've always been very clear about at West London Free School is that we like teacher led lessons. Mm -hmm. And uh, we think that there's a good evidence base for that. We think from what we see around the school that that is, for the most part, the best way for pupils to learn. However, we are aware that, uh, there is uh, there is the danger that pupils become um but mentally passive it is easier in those sorts of lessons perhaps to um uh to fool the teacher into thinking that you're learning when you're not actually so we've been doing a lot on uh encouraging teachers to check for understanding um encouraging teachers to get pupils not just to speak in lessons but to speak well um we have yeah various initiatives for that but it feels like something that we uh, I think we've improved this year on, but there's still some way to go. Um, and even if it, it's one of those things that even if it had zero impact on pu pupil outcomes, we would still be wanting because um, irrespective of pupils get the confidence to be able to speak in front of their peers and the willingness and ability to project their voice in a room is just one of those benefits that, you know, everyone should should have Absolutely. from being at school. Absolutely. Um, so that, I mean, in terms of teaching and learning, that's one of the big focuses. We, um, I think we've still got work that we can do in helping our lower prior attainers. Um, we, I think, at the top end, pupils at the West End Free School do really well. Um, we've had pupils getting into Oxbridge every year since the sixth form started. We've had four Oxbridge offers in history this year, which has Maybe. been uh, wonderful, which is 50% of the Oxbridge offers for the school. Um, which we're very happy about, but I think that there's uh, there's more work that we could be doing with the low prior attainers, particularly when it comes to literacy. Um, we've got someone who's starting new at the school in September who's going to have responsibility 
um, uh, teaching literacy to groups of low prior attainers, uh, but also a, a better common language throughout the school in how we talk about sentence construction and paragraph construction. Um, uh, so the, yeah, those are two uh, teaching and learning things that we're focusing on. Um, and we have, uh, I, I, as a third thing, one of the big focuses that we've had this year is rewards. Um, so we have a very tight, very effective behavior system, which is integral to the school running well. Um, but I think it has in the past been at the expense of recognizing pupils doing things uh, positively. Yeah. It's a much more system. And I think kind of tied in with the pupil voice thing as well. We, um, not pupil voice, pupil we want pupils to speak more in front of their peers. So we have had, we've done more um, uh, public speaking events at the school, mm -hmm. but I would love if I could find the time in assemblies every week for pupils to their peers in assembly. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's I've, something. I've done quite a lot of reading on oracy and especially because yeah. I spend some with, with on Suffolk as well. And it's getting students to be able to go to a dinner party with anybody who goes to a public school and to, to be the same as them. So, you know, yeah. so that you've, you've got exactly the same sort of vocabulary and you've got exactly the same, you're, you're, you're exposed to the same types of texts and anything so that you're put in the right, the right place to compete with them when it comes to Oxford, when it comes to Cambridge yeah. and things. I think, yeah, I really agree. That and if you good. go to, if you go to a public school, especially with uh, a, a Church of England public school, which most, um, they will have readings in chapel. And I would love for our school, which doesn't have a faith affiliation, to have a secular equivalent of that, to put together uh, a selection of readings that could be read and repeated kind of year on year so people get to know them. And, you know, we have 39 teaching weeks um, in a year. We've got 130 pupils. So if you have an assembly every week in three years, you could give every pupil the opportunity to speak in front of their peers in assembly delivering one of these readings. So that's something that we would would love to put in next year. Yes, that sounds absolutely brilliant. I'd like to come and see that. That'd be absolutely, yeah, <laughs> really great. Um, so can you talk us through a little bit about you as an author? So obviously you've published some textbooks, you've published uh, a, a very good book called Pro Progressively Worse, um, and obviously more, more recently Meet the Georgians. So what sort of your inspirations behind those, those things? Where, where do your ideas um... come from? <laughs> <laughs> The, the common thread is they are all in history books. Um, progressively worse, which was the first thing that I wrote, um, is is really a, a modern history methods from the oh, from the nineteen sixties onwards. Well, that's what the good half of the book is. There's sort of two halves of the book. One is a potted history of teaching methods in schools, and then the other half is a sort of critique of child centred learning. Um, and I had the misfortune of the book being published in the same year as Daisy Christodoulou's book, Seven Myths About Education, which did the critique of child-centered learning much better than I did. So I say to anybody who reads Progressively Worse, read the first bit, the second half, just read uh, read Daisy's book. Um, yeah. But yeah, the, the first half, which is the, the history of teaching methods, I just felt when I was teaching in Birmingham, I was teaching in a school that had, uh, uh, that was... Uh, yeah, it wasn't just a, a knowledge basis to the curriculum it was absent. It was positively discouraged. It was really uh, that imbued the whole curriculum design and teaching approach, and and a real um, uh, a real aversion to teacher led methods as well. Um, and I had I had read, read, read I had this sense, I had this feeling that these weren't new ideas, and that these were ideas that had been around for a long time. Mm -hmm. And um, and I had read during my degree and during my master's in history, I'd read some 20th century history about sort of 1960s and 1970s culture wars, um, a term that has come back in vogue, but was very much used back then as classroom was a real center for it. There's a sort of turn in the 1960s and 1970s was the wellspring of a lot of these ideas. And what I wanted to do it progressively worse was just to say these ideas that often are sold in a very utopian way and are often said to be the avant-garde are actually 40, 50 years old. And for 40 or 50 years, 
failing to fulfill their promise in the classroom. Um, and uh, and I hope that, uh, I think particularly for people who have a sort of bent to the way they like to think about things, it was a useful perspective on that debate, which I'm sure you remember from 2000, you know, around that time was really raging. There were so many interesting conversations going on at that time. Definitely. So what, um, if, you, if you had to say what the best ever CPD you either hosted or ran or went to yourself would be, what would that be? Gosh, um, I always say the best CPD is going visiting other schools, which may be a cop-out answer. Uh, yeah, it's, it's one of the things that, yeah, it's one of the things that Ben and I brought in actually when we became joint heads was we moved one of our inset days to mid-November. And um, we had a day in mid-November where every member of staff got to go and visit another school. And it's something that we're going to keep now as a, um, uh, as a yearly fixture. Um, because I just, uh, do you know what, going to like conferences and things like education festivals and things like that, the CPD is always, is always really beneficial and enjoyable, but it's the incidental conversations that I mm -hmm. often remember most and come away with most is the sort of, you know, the pub after research ed environments. Um, and ov obviously a lot of the conversations are excited and talking about these sessions that they've seen. But I often think that the nice thing about those events is as much who you meet as, uh, um, as, as the things you go and see. Um, I just think that, uh, yeah, visiting schools and, and having the ability, having the opportunity to go and do that just gives you so many ideas. And often it isn't even directly related to the things that you're seeing. It's just the mental space to sit in a school which isn't your own and reflect about what you do. Yeah. Um, and, and yeah, and just to think, oh, I think this would be really good or I think this would work really well with our staff. It's just, you know, people like you doing doing what you do, but in a different way. And I think there's, yeah. there's so much to be said for that, yeah. And, and there are tiny things that I now walk to a free school and see. And if I think hard, I can think back to where we got that idea from. And they now just seem blindingly obvious, but all of them were things that I saw in another school and thought, mm. oh my God, you've got to do that. I mean, a tiny example would be, I remember going and visiting um, uh, Oasis South Bank. Yeah. Um, and they had their duty list uh, mm. on the stairwell on each floor. Um, so if you were just checking who's, who, who's on duty, you didn't have to kind of go onto the files bit of your phone and try and find it out. You, you knew that there was a physical copy up somewhere. Um, and I remember that was such a good idea. And now it would seem mad to me that that wouldn't occur to you. But it hadn't. In all those years, it hadn't occurred to us until we saw it being done somewhere else. So what is the best for you, the best bit of educational research or reading that stands the test of time that you would say perhaps to an ECQ read this apart from doing this so <laughs> <laughs> no, I couldn't, I couldn't really recommend that I um I think in terms of the book that I most enjoyed reading uh um it probably Hirsch cultural literacy okay because it's so well written and um and it's not written by a teacher, um, which is, I'm not saying that's a benefit, but um, I think it's about more than just teaching methods. It kind of, it made me think about just uh, you know, <laughs> like living in general. It's really, I think it's a really profound book um, about the nature of knowledge and the nature of class and society and lots of different things so I think in terms of reading experience I still very distinctly remember reading that when I was first training to be a teacher and that sense of scales falling from your eyes being really there uh, I think the most is why don't students like school uh, Willingham's book Daniel Willingham um, and I think to any new teacher, that that would be very high on the list. In fact, it's a sort it's, of it's quite easy cord. to read, isn't it? And it's quite relatable to to what's going on in front of them as well. Yeah, and I think it also it's really good um, if you're ever in a school where you're being asked to do things that you know aren't working, and you just want to find a way. Of... Mm -hmm. That book often is a real uh, help. But then I think in terms of that really make you think and reflect quite deeply. What does this mean for Monday morning? But when I'm back in my kind of, yeah, my lesson period one, 
um, uh, the, uh, Sean Allison and Andy Farby's book, uh, Making Every Lesson Count. Yeah, I've, I've, I haven't read it, but I definitely heard it, yeah. Yeah, I really like that. It synthesizes a lot of the things, you know, more Hirsch or whoever okay. it might, may be and gives them it's written by two teachers it's written by a science teacher and an english teacher so it gives really good classroom illustrations of those of those ideas brilliant sounds good um and uh, and that's why i like doing these podcasts is because you get different answers from lots of different people um yeah and it's really interesting to get into, into your brain and to find out you know which one worked for you because there's so much out there mm. um so what we're gonna do now <clears throat> Is we're going to do a little quiz, if you don't mind, just so that we can get to know you. Um, and then I'm going yeah. to ask you, I'm going to ask you a, a, the last question was going to build up to an answer as well. So you're only allowed to pick one and you're not allowed to think about it for too long. OK, so it's just really silly things like uh, dogs or cats. Dogs. Chinese food or Indian food. Indian food. Staff room or your own office. Oh, that's unfair now that I'm a You're allowed to say it have to be office. my own. I, I I, like do you know what? You know what? I, uh, we have a coffee machine in our staff room and I still use it because the coffee is excellent. And I find I have lots of the most important conversations of the day waiting in the coffee queue. So uh, for that reason, I'm going to say the staff room. Your, your staff will be very proud. Um, an Android <laughs> phone or an iPhone? iPhone. <laughs> Hiking or jogging? Ooh, jogging, I think. Okay. Primary or secondary? Secondary. Obviously. Uh, beer or wine? Beer. Um, swimming or sunbathing? Sunbathing, definitely. I'm trying to figure out what kind of, what kind of man you are when it comes to your family. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Uh, and marking or no marking? Ooh, marking. Okay, talk to me about that, because marking is everywhere at the moment. Yeah, and we've actually been write, rewriting our homework and feedback policy at West Summer Creek School. Um, and we, it started, the draft version started as our homework marking and feedback. And then it became our homework and feedback policy because marking is a form of feedback, but mm -hmm. it's a subsection of feedback, we felt. We felt that, um, uh, and I think I... What do I think about marking? I think... Oh, I, 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 I'll jump in. I think it's important. Yeah. I think it's important, but you have to, you have to put yourself first. So, because I think students like, like to know you've looked at their work. Yeah. And I also, yeah, I think students like to know that, they, that you've looked at their work. We've got an English teacher at our school who always says, uh, whenever, if anyone says to her, she's one of those teachers who, who who marks a huge amount and mm. pupils recognize it and pupils will sometimes one year and have another teacher the next year they'll say oh why why isn't my work being marked like it was by such and such teacher um and she always says even if someone would say to her it has no impact at all that's zero evidence of the impact that she it has she says it's an act of love i i love the pupils so i teach i respect the people so i teach and if they're writing for me it's incumbent upon me to read it um and i think I think really, actually, what I really, so I still teach an A-level class, um, two double periods, so four hours a week. And I still, mar I mark an essay a week um, from each of them. And I think actually what I'm doing really, I'm writing a few things on their work, but not extensively. I'm really, and it tells me so many things. Not only does it tell me how they're doing, it also tells me how I'm doing. You get a real sense of the success of your lessons by looking at the pupil outputs. Um, and it immediately informs what I do the next lesson, reading what, what they've done there. And I think that's, I think that's vital. I think teachers, the most important ideas they'll have for how they're going to do something different the following year should come from when they're looking at pupils' work. So really, I think what you're often, what you're doing is, especially in a subject like history, um, and you'll be kidding yourself if you think marking is what actually takes a long time. You know, a tick and a kind of why is that question mark, that sort of thing. That doesn't take up much Taking up the time is the reading. Uh, and I think it's an important thing to do to, to read and review people's work. Um, yeah. And 
and I think the more experience you get, the quicker you get to doing it. Yeah, um, I know, I know exactly how long it takes to get a to get a pile of that year twelve pupils' work marked, and and it's not you know, a, a, and it, and I can make it manageable. But the key is just being so strict with yourself and just not spending any anywhere longer than is necessary on it. Absolutely, and I've I've just started teaching geography or a bit of geography, and obviously I've been teaching history for a long, long time. Um, I have mm. taught a little bit of geography, but not not in this much detail. So I know when it comes to marking, it's going to take me a lot longer than it would usually when it comes to my my history work, just because I'm I'm just I'm not an expert in it. Although yeah. there's a lot more words in a lot of the history work that you would do in comparative to some of the geography work. So it's it's vice versa, isn't it? Um, yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna end it there, um, and I think, as I say, we could talk for hours and hours and hours. And I think you're absolutely wonderful, and I think um, I, I'm really, really inspired by what you're doing at the West London Free School as well. And I think if anybody out there wants to go and visit a school, if you're allowed to, uh, go, go and go and visit it because there's some fantastic things and some really great practice to take away with there too. So thank you so, so much for your oh, time. Thank you. That's my pleasure. Thank you for your kind. <laughs>